Okay, today I would like to present my case of coronoid hyperplasia. My patient was a 16-year-old male presented to her clinic saying, I can't open my mouth wide. He reported of gradual decrease of mouth opening over four years. No significant history of trauma to his head and neck and no pain or limitation of movement of any other joint of his body. He reported of occasional TMJ clicking, but not all the time. His mother-in-law reported that he collided with his sister on a bike when he was in 8th grade. However, the patient denied that this was such a significant collision and he also said that he didn't hit his head or neck. So his examination revealed no significant pain in TMJ or muscle on palpation. No significant facial asymmetry was noted. His mandibular opening was 24 millimeters with firm end feel. His lateral movements were not great but pretty much equal on both sides, little less to his left. No joint sound was noted during the examination. And on palpation, his translation movement of the condyle was smooth with good coordination of left and right. So this is the panoramic x-ray we took. And it was inconclusive in determining the cause of his limited opening. We ordered CT and not MRI because his translation was quite smooth and he reported that his clicking is occasional and didn't get progressively worse. His jaw didn't get locked all of a sudden, but more of a gradual decrease of mouth opening over four years. We suspected that this could be an unnoticed tripod fracture of his zygomatic arch, possibly in the bike collision when he was small, um, maybe in this area. So we wanted to evaluate his bony structure, so that's why we got CT scan. And this is the initial report we got. Everything was normal, and they suggested taking MRI for further evaluation. The mandibles are within normal limits. TMJ are normal. No evidence of fractures. And here they recommended MRI of the TMJ for further evaluation. They only sent us a report and didn't send us the original data or images. So we called the imaging center and requested for the images. And this is what we saw. On axial slices, you can see that right coronoid process extends beyond the condyle right here. The right coronoid extends beyond the level of maxillary sinus and still can be recognized at the slice at the level of the eyes. On the image on the right side, right here, you can also recognize the reactive exostosis of the zygoma from repetitive minor trauma to the zygoma during the movement of the mandible. These are a sagittal view of his right TMJ. As you can see, the coronary process extends beyond the height of the condyle and also curved extending anteriorly. You can also see the reactive exostosis of the zygoma in this slice too. And this is the coronal slice. Right coronoid is significantly long, but the left coronoid also seems to be elongated to the level of zygomatic arch. And from the given images, I attempted to get a 3D reconstruction view. And these images are of the right side. You can see the elongated coronoid process with the anterior curve and also right here. And this is of the left side. You can see that the left corner process also extends beyond 
the zygomatic arch. From the given images and from the clinical examination, our diagnosis was bilateral coronoid hyperplasia of unknown etiology. For treatment, our options were coronoidotomy or coronoidectomy, which will be followed by physical therapy. We referred the patient to oral surgeon Dr. Bak Lee. They actually decided to take another CT scan at LA County Hospital because they can get a better 3D reconstruction image. I wasn't very impressed to hear that because that's another CT amount of radiation exposure. But when I saw the image they sent us, I was very, very impressed. This is 3D reconstruction image of the right coronoid. It clearly extends way beyond the zygomatic arch and you can also see the anterior curve here. And this is the left side which also extends above the zygomatic arch and also longer than the condyle. The most common approach for coronoidectomy is an intraoral approach, opening a flap along the ramus just like SSRO for orthognathic surgery. And this is his maximum opening during the operation. Both left and right coronoids were removed, but his opening only increased from 24 millimeters to 33 millimeters. This was a little disappointing, but it was somewhat expected thinking that he hasn't been opening his mouth more than 24 millimeters for almost four years. His masticatory muscles probably have already gone through contracture or it never grew in length. Kids grow a lot from 12 years old to 16 years old, but function also supports growth and if it were not moved during that period of time, masticatory muscles may not grow. So these are the removed coronoid processes from the right and the left. Both sides were removed and submitted for histopathological examination which revealed normal bony structure meaning hyperplasia. No osteochondroma or osteosarcoma so that was very good. So, this is his maximum active opening in his initial visit, and this is his visit two months after coronoidectomy. His opening improved from 24 millimeters to 37 millimeters. By performing coronoidectomy, we're not looking for an improvement from here to here, but still, an improvement of maximum opening from 24 millimeters to 37 millimeters is a significant difference. Now, let's talk about coronoid hyperplasia in general. Coronoid hyperplasia was first reported in 1853 by Langenbach. No epidemiological studies have been done for this condition and therefore no incidence and prevalence numbers regarding coronoid hyperplasia were found. In PubMed, with the keyword of coronoid hyperplasia, there were 111 hits and if this is narrowed down to case reports, there were only 77 hits. From here, you can see that this is quite a rare condition. Systematic review published by Mulder et al. in 2012 included 61 cases of coronoid hyperplasia reported after 1995. He found that the mean age of diagnosis to be about 23 years old, ranging from 0 to 61 and the peak incidence being 15 to 19 years old. This condition is more likely to be bilateral than unilateral 
and more commonly seen in male. Previously published systematic review by McLaughlin et al. in 1995 included 31 cases of coronoid hyperplasia and reported of very similar findings. Wenghofer et al. proposed temporalis hyperactivity theory as the cause of coronoid hyperplasia. He found three cases with temporalis hyperplasia and two cases with hypertonic masticatory muscles due to a neurological disorder in a patient with coronoid hyperplasia. However, Gerbino et al. in 1997 and Yamaguchi et al. in 1998 both reported contradicting articles reporting EMG studies of both temporalis and masseter muscles of coronary hyperplasia patients were no different from healthy controls. Some authors suggested trauma was associated with coronary hyperplasia, but only one case out of 61 cases included in the systematic review by Milder et al. reported trauma, and therefore there is no evidence to support this theory. York et al. reported two cases of coronoid hyperplasia in siblings and proposed possible hereditary or genetics cause of coronoid hyperplasia. However, there are no other reports of familial history, so there is no strong evidence here either. Finally, hormonal involvement is of course discussed because it's a growth abnormality, but there's no evidence to support this theory either. So right now, it is mostly of unknown etiology. In the report of Mulder et al., the mean maximum mandibular opening was 16 millimeters ranging from 2 mm up to 32 mm. As diagnostic tools, coronoid hyperplasia is suspected on panoramic x-ray when its height exceeds that of the condyle. However, coronoid process is often unclear, superimposed by the artifact from zygomatic arch, maxillary tuberosity, hard palate, and sphenoid, and it's even worse when you take an open pan to evaluate for the condyle. Thus, it is always the best to take CT to get the clear view of the coronoid process itself. Here you can't really see the coronoid process because it's in the maxillary tuberosity and hard palate region. And here, well, you can kind of see coronal process here, but it's also kind of hard to visualize the, the exact length. And here, you can't really see the coronal process here, too. And here as well. And in here, you also can't really see the coronal process. Well, I included in one of the five pans that I just showed, one of the pan was the patient with coronary hyperplasia. Did any of you realize that I had one in there? That's why we need to see CT for the most of the cases. Lewandowski proposed analyzing the ratio of the length of the condyle to the length of the coronary process. In healthy control, maximum ratio was 1.07. However, in the patients with coronary hyperplasia, the minimum ratio was 1.15. So he concluded that if the ratio was greater than 1.1, the patient should be further evaluated using CT. Although it seems like a convenient and rational way of analysis, we can't do this analysis with open pen that we take in our clinic. And also, as I made my point in the previous slide, often it is very hard to clearly visualize the coronoid process. So, what can we do for the treatment? As it was performed in our case, 
Intraoral approach is the most common procedure. However, compared to extraoral approach, it has a higher risk of developing post-op hematoma and fibrosis, thus resulting in scarring and recurrence of limitation of mouth opening. Although extraoral approach is less likely to develop hematoma and also get a better access to the surgical site, there is an increased risk of facial nerve damage and of course a visible scar. In a systematic review of the cornoid hyperplasia, out of 50 reviewed cases, 47 cases were intraoral approach. In the same study, 42 cases were cornoid ectomy and the rest were cornoid otomy. Cornoid otomy is when you cut the cornoid process apart from the ramus, but you don't remove it. You just leave it in there and close. Cornoid ectomy is when you cut the cornoid process and take it out. Cornoid otomy actually had a better range of maximum mouth opening right after the surgery when compared to cornoid ectomy. This is thought to be due to less post-op hematoma and fibrosis as well as posterior positioning of the detached cornoid after cornoid otomy. Cornoid otomy takes less procedure time and it is less traumatic when compared to cornoid ectomy. It is easier and therefore it is less expensive. However, there is one big downside to this procedure. You cannot perform histopathological evaluation of the cornoid process, which may possibly be osteochondroma or osteosarcoma. So how successful are these procedures? Actually, it's not very impressive. In most of the reports and systematic reviews, not many cases reported maximum mouth opening greater than 40 millimeters in the long term. AAOMS set the impairment of opening to be under 35 millimeters. If opening of greater than 35 millimeters is considered a success, then the success rate will be 62%. Others set the goal a little lower and said maximum opening of greater than 30 millimeter is a success. And if you use this criteria, then the success rate will of course go up to 82%. In any case, just like I mentioned in the case of TMJ ankylosis, post-op physical therapy is the most important aspect of treatment. This will actually go for any type of treatment for limited mouth opening. But especially in the surgical case, to prevent scarring or re-ankylosis, physical therapy is the key to successful treatment. Limited mouth opening significantly impacts the quality of life of the patient. Although mouth opening of 40 millimeters may not be achieved, maximum opening of around 35 millimeters will allow the individual to enjoy entertainment, eat delicious meal, and most importantly, allows the person to have decent medical care. Patient with limited mouth opening will have limited access to dental treatment and importantly, in the critical situation, limited mouth opening causes trouble for intubation. This is why it is critical to have a decent mouth opening. 50 millimeter increase in the maximum mouth opening will change the patient's life from here to here. Well, that concludes my presentation. 
Thank you very much for your attention.